Mr. Tony Burroughs is equally adept at a writing pad or in front of an audience. Tony Burroughs is a rare, rare storyteller whose tales speak to something deep within us all. He is an avocado farmer turned self-empowerment advocate and community maker who has co-founded the world's fastest growing intentional community, the Intenders of the Highest Good. Tony is also the producer of the Intention Process video and a prolific author. The Code, 10 Intentions for a Better World, boldly presents us with a workable solution for the challenges facing our world today. The AMTA National Convention is filled with education sessions to arm you with the business, research, and practice skills you need to be successful in today's fast-evolving massage therapy profession. Tony's words will inspire you to think about what you can and can't control within your own environment to give yourself every opportunity for success. It is my personal deep pleasure to introduce to you Mr. Tony Burroughs. Great pleasure to be here with you this day. And I'd like to thank Judy and Liz and all of the people with the AMTA who were responsible for bringing me here today. And those who know me know that I don't do much of anything without making an intention first. So I'm going to do that because intentionality, that's my field. And I intend that everything needing to be known is known here this day that all of my words and all of, all of our words are clear, precise, uplifting, helpful, and fun. Yeah. That for each and every one of us here, we are guided, guarded, protected, and connected throughout this entire experience, and that everything we say and do serves the highest and best good of the universe, ourselves, and everyone everywhere. And so be it. And so it is. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see. I was in Mount Shasta recently. I had gone there to uh, set up one of our intender circles in a bookstore there. And the place was so gorgeous that uh, my friend Daniel and I, we decided to stay on and camp with the beautiful mountain looming in front of us. And the only problem was that it was... Um, in August, and there were no motel or hotel rooms at this time. And so we got the last spot in the last campground, uh, about eight miles out of Shasta Town. And we set up camp there, and the only problem with this particular campground, can you see me on here? Oh, good. Oh, I'm, oh my goodness. <laughs> The only challenge with this particular campground was that there were no bathing facilities. And the way you would see people bathing in the morning, they'd line along the uh, Sacramento River, which ran right through the campground, and uh, with a, uh, a gallon a jug or a container of some sort, crouched down in, uh, and uh, dipping the jug in the water, everybody wearing swimming trunks and so forth, and pouring it over their head. And the water is ice cold there, and everybody's hopping and cussing and muttering the whole time. Water's freezing there, coming the headwaters of the Sacramento River coming out. And uh, so those were the bathing arrangements. And as I said, this was in August. And on this particular day, I remember looking at the camp manager's uh, thermometer. There was a, uh, a thermometer on his little uh, shack there. And it said that it was 108 degrees. So what with the bathing arrangements the way they were and... Uh, uh, everybody was just sweating profusely, didn't want to be sitting downwind of anybody. <laughs> Why? Uh, that's just, uh, I got to the point where I was sitting with a group of people in about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and just strangers from all over the country with a couple of picnic tables butted up against each other, just drinking sodas and beers and getting to know each other and, and having fun uh, on vacation there at Mount Shasta. And... Uh, as again, so it was so hot and sweaty, I finally just said, I intend that I have a hot shower and get clean now. And they all looked at me like I was crazy. 
because there were no showers for eight miles. You would have had to gone and rented a motel. There weren't any. And so uh, we sat there uh, chatting for another, one more than 10 minutes. And a deer comes scampering right through the campground, right past the picnic table we're at. And again, I'm a Hawaii boy. Hi, Greg, how you doing? There's another Hawaii boy out there. Uh, there they are. I'm a Hawaii boy. There are no deer in Hawaii. I'd never seen a deer before. <laughs> so I'm up and running to go get a glimpse of this deer. And uh, I find myself in a clearing about 15 feet away from where the people are sitting with the picnic tables butted up against each other. And I'm in this clearing, and the only view I got of the deer was a little white tail going, bounding through the brush and gone, and that was it. And in the clearing was a, a single tree about this big around. And on the back side of this tree is a broken off branch about arm level up here, about a foot, foot and a half long. And hanging on that branch was one of those black plastic solar shower bags. <laughs> Left there by a previous camper. And I walk back, I pick the shower bag off the branch and walk back to the, to the uh, people at the picnic table. And the long and the short of it all is that by sunset, we'd all had a hot shower and they were not looking at me like I was so crazy anymore. So, so what I'm suggesting to you is that the time is coming when you will have a thought and it will be there and that these times are preparation unto that. And then there's an acceleration going on, a speeding up, and y'all know it. Y'all know it. I like that word, y'all. I've just been spending my time down here in the South. We were in Houston last week. They said that y'all, now there's, the, there's a plural for y'all. It's all y'all. <laughs> so... God, I'm, I amuse myself so easily. <laughs> so there's an exp uh, a speeding up going on. And one of the things we've noticed in our intender circles uh, that is characteristic of this speeding up going on is that the time between the time you make an intention and it manifests is getting shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter. So and we've realized that our thoughts and our words create our world. That what we say and, and what we think, that's what we get. And how do we take that piece of information and put it to its highest and best use? And so it's become, it's just, we've realized that it's wise for us to just get more vigilant with what we're thinking and what we're saying. And it really helps if you've got some like-minded and light-hearted friends who are also staying awake to that piece of information because I don't know about you, but every now and then I fall completely asleep to it. And then uh, if I fall asleep to it and I'm sitting there talking to Judy, she might say, <clears throat> hey, Tony, you might not want to say that because it's just not going to give you the results you're looking for. So indeed, our thoughts create our world. And that's one of the first uh, reference points that we started our group's our intender circles with. And as we got into it, I, we've been doing these intender circles for over 15 years, long before The Secret came out and all of that. And uh, we've realized a couple of things that are very important. And the first thing is that it is wise for us to get proficient at the fine art of manifesting. Not just dabble with it or fiddle around with it or check it out but get good at getting that which we desire to come to us as easily and effortlessly as possible. Because if we do not do that, we remain at the mercy of people and forces outside ourselves who may not care in the least about us. So getting good at manifesting, that's number one. Until that happens, everything just happens to you. But a person who gets proficient at manifesting becomes a conscious creator, a conscious co-creator. And the second thing we've realized is that if we're going to create the peace and the freedom and the joy and the abundance and the grace 
and the fulfillment and all the good things that we deserve as being humans upon this planet at this time, why we need to begin to come together and work together in community. Community. I cannot tell you how honored I am to be here in a community that's had 66 conventions. This is one of the best examples of community on this planet, the AMTA. And I acknowledge you and I honor you for it. And I just, it is my intention that the rest of the world catches on because we've been separated every which way. We've been separated by race, by religion, by class, by sex, by uh, political party, by borders and boundaries, and you name it. And it is time for us to begin to come together. Yeah. Yeah. Woo! That felt good. One of the things that we have learned in our intender circles with 15 years of practicing manifestation techniques and so forth is, uh, has to do with this uh, code I wrote, this 10 intents of uh, the code, 10 intentions for, the better, for a better world. The third intent is set your course. And we've realized that those who get up in the morning and set a direction under their day have an entirely different experience than those who do not. Everything comes easier for them. Their day goes smoother. The things they want in their life come to them because they have consciously got up in the morning and set a direction to what's going to happen. And those, those who do not do that, well, anything goes. So I suggest unto you that what would happen if you're in your office in the morning and you get together with your fellow massage therapists and you just stood there and you made a few intentions for how the day was going to go and how your week was going to go and you even held hands in a circle and everybody said their intentions and maybe you toned or maybe you chanted or maybe you just did made a sound together I suggest to you that if you do something like that everything would change Everything, because you bring, you bring consciousness. You bring a deliberateness unto your work. You'll see. Oh, how we doing? Okay. I don't know about you, but I need to stretch a little bit, so it's everybody stand up. Okay. All right. And we found out something real interesting, that something wondrous happens when a whole bunch of people get together and send light to everybody else in the room. So I'd like all of you to face them and all of you over there on that side of the aisle to face them and begin to rub your hands together, just like this. Just like this. You can feel that energy filling up your hands. You know it. More friction you get, the lighter it gets. All right. Now we're going to loosen it up a little bit. We're going to wiggle a little bit. Shake your booty a little bit. Get it going. There we go. Yeah. Loosen it up. Oh, yeah. All right. There you go. And we're going to buzz like a bee. Bzzz. 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 Okay, now just put your hands out. Send that light right through to everybody else in the room and receive it at the same time. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna put this 
over here. Okay. All righty. Oh, that felt good. I love that picture that Diana had for the foundation's opening thing with the hands, with the light. See, thank you for that one, Diana. Because that's the cutting edge. And I'm a little bit, uh, I'm always thinking about what is the most relevant, what is the uh, most important thing we can be talking about in this time we share together. And I think a lot of it has to do with this thing called the new paradigm. I'm a new paradigmer because this acceleration we're going through, why, it's, uh, it's affecting everybody. Nobody knows quite what's going to happen. And I'm in the process right now we, of uh, writing my, what, seventh book or something like that, and people have been talking now for quite a while about this thing called the law of attraction. And I'm very interested in that subject, getting proficient at manifesting like we were talking about. And then there's another law that's called the law of allowing that's just as interesting. But I'm interested in one that most people aren't talking about nowadays. It also starts with A. It's called the law of agreement. And the law of agreement, it's the title of my next book, by the way, the law, <laughs> coming soon, whenever I figure out a way to finish it. The law of agreement, simply put, is that agreement breeds realities. Agreement breeds re or creates belief systems. And all of our belief systems and all our realities exist because we agree upon them. And... Just think about it. If you have one more person agrees with anybody about any particular belief system, it makes that belief system that much stronger. You know, if you get one person says, hey, it's a good idea to go dump a bunch of toxic waste in the water and, and uh, mess with our food supply and kill our dolphins, then that's one person. And then you get 10 people to agree that it's a good idea to go dump some toxic waste in the water. And if you get a, then that's a little bit more. And if you get uh, a thousand people or 10,000 or 100,000 people agree and it's a good idea that it's okay if we go dump waste in the, uh, in the oceans. Why, pretty soon we're over there dumping waste in the oceans and everybody thinks it's okay because we agree upon it. In other words, what I'm saying is that our agreements are the building blocks of our belief systems, of our realities. And you've always got the choice at any given time right there in your pocket as to whether you want to agree with something and thus strengthen that belief system or withhold your agreement now and um, not add to that particular belief system whatever it is. And then it becomes a question of discernment. Does this belief system, is this idea that's being um, presented to me, whether it comes through the media, whether it comes through a well-intentioned friend, whatever, does this belief or idea, does it serve me, and therefore I'll agree with it, or does it not serve me, and I'm going to withhold my agreement and not add to that, and one more person not adding to some of those belief systems that are now obsolete, because there is so much human suffering, and that is why you see all those people on the tables that, that you're helping out. There is so much discord and discomfort in this world, that it's time to begin to withhold our agreements from some of these belief systems that are no longer working for us. That is part of that paradigm shift we are going through. Some of those old ways are going away. Ah. Ah. So, in the early days of the intenders, we used to talk about how some people had what we called their hip pocket drama. You know what I mean. See, people just, you walk up and they're talking to you and all of a sudden you realize you're, they just, uh, you're embroiled in their drama. They just sort of like whipped it out of their hip pocket on you, <laughs> you know. And then you, uh, you know, you're uh, all of a sudden feeling a little bit dumped on or drained and they walk away feeling better, but they just go on to the next person, the next person, the next person. Nothing really ever changes. And we really wanted to... Um, figure out a way where we 
help them. And one of the things we realized is that if we withheld our agreement from some of those hip pocket dramas, that it had them looking, uh, looking a little bit different about what they were saying, what they were doing. And so when somebody would approach us and they would uh, begin to uh, lay out their hip pocket drama on you, we got good at going, they'd start into the drama and we'd go, oh, or mmm. We wouldn't even nod. We wouldn't even do this because immediately, if you nod, there's an agreement and whew, there's an exchange of energy and you got to go figure out how to get rid of all the charge. So, law of agreement, the hip pocket dramas. Huh. I'd like to tell you a story, if I might, that I've been leading into. It's a new paradigm kind of story. It'll have some of you thinking. And the story is about a wonderful young lady, and her name is Mary Ann. And Mary Ann is an accountant, and she goes into the city to work every day, rides the commuter train for about 20, 15, 20 minutes uh, into her office. Mary Ann is in her uh, mid to late 30s, she's single, attractive, outgoing, you'd like her. She lives with her mother. This story that I'm about to tell you is cut right out of today's headlines. And it will, ch it will for many of you, save your lives. One day, Mary Ann gets on the commuter train, and she uh, sits down, and a young man boards the train, a, a man she'd never seen before, and he's wearing a navy pea coat and a cap, and he's carrying a bird cage, and the bird cage is empty, and he sets the bird cage down, and he nods at her, and she smiles back cordially, uh, nonverbal communication, nice uh, meeting, and they go on to work. She goes on to do her accounting that day, and he gets off the train, too, about the same time. And the next day, the same thing happens again, but the second day, he doesn't have the bird cage. And she notices the second day that he's a little pale. He's a little peaked. Doesn't look quite as healthy as he did the day before. And she doesn't think much of it. And the following day, uh, same thing. They both get on, face each other, smile. And this particular day, he's even a little more pale and a little more, uh, looks like he might be even losing a little bit of weight. He looks like he's a little bit weak. And throughout the following several days of getting on the train, they both uh, face each other. They're a few uh, aisles away. And each uh, passing day, he progressively looks a little more pale, and he's beginning to get some circles under his eyes. And by the end of the second week, he's beginning to cough. And this goes on again for several more days each day, progressively weaker, until one day she gets on the train to go to work, and he's not there. And after two or three more days of that, her curiosity finally gets the best of her. And she goes and asks the conductor, what happened to that guy in the Navy pea coat? And the conductor tells her that he died, that he had the BV, the bird virus. And she thinks about that and then goes on to work, rides the train in, goes into her office, and she's on the second floor, and as she uh, comes into the lobby of her accounting office. There's a coffee table in the lobby, and on the coffee table is a newspaper. And the newspaper headlines that day are a little bit thicker, a little bolder than normal. And they say, BV claims many lives. <gasps> and she picks up the paper and begins to read. And the paper says that The BV is running rampant, and it begins to describe the same symptoms that the fellow in the Navy pea coat had. Paleness, cough, circles under the eyes, rapid weight loss, weakness, incurable, nothing they 
seem to be able to do about it yet. Quick decline, death. And it goes on to say, further down in the article, that there are hot spots where a person is more apt to catch the BV. Places like airports, bus stations, commuter train stations. She puts the paper down and gathers herself together, but before she goes in to sit down at her desk that day, she goes into the office, she goes into the restroom, rather, and she washes her face, and as she's drying her face in the mirror, she looks in the mirror, and she sees just the beginning faintness of a shadow under her eye. That evening, she goes home, and while she and her mother are having their dinner, her mother turns on the 6 o'clock news, and the news, the 6 o'clock news, is ablaze with stories of the BV, describing the symptoms, the Photoshop graphics are going crazy, the footage they pull out of the woodwork for all this stuff, and sure enough, uh, it's describing exactly the same thing the newspaper had and exactly the same thing that the guy in the navy pea coat had. And later on, before she goes to bed, she feels a little bit weak. She gets up the next morning, goes on to work, still feeling weaker, looks in the mirror. She's starting to get pale. Three days later, she doesn't even feel like going to work. And a couple days after that, She's bedridden, and her dear mother calls the doctor, and the doctor comes and sa tells, uh, tells them that, yes, indeed, it's the BV, and that there isn't much he can do about her except make her last days more comfortable, and he gives her some medicine, and he leaves. Four days after that, her mother thinking that her beautiful daughter is going to die at any moment, calls a priest. Only the priest that her mother calls isn't your average priest. He's a new paradigm priest. And he knows only to see the wellness, never to see the sickness. He knows how to hold the light for others while they're unable to hold the light for themselves. And he knows to see her with this magical, wondrous light-working tool that we call our imagination. He knows how to see her in her highest light, already healed, happy, healthy, whole, and humming with life. And he teaches the mother, how to do that, to see her daughter in her highest light. And he even teaches Marianne herself how to hold the light for herself and see herself already well, already well. And then, before he leaves, he puts his hands on her and he massages her a little bit. And while he's massaging her, he's sending the light and love of the universe that is everywhere present. He sends it through his hands, just like you just did in that exercise with the buzzing, to every cell, every molecule, every strand of DNA in her body. And he fills her up with light. And he leaves. Three hours later, Marianne is out of bed. Two days later, she's up and around. And a week and a half later, she's back to her normal life and back at work, living her life to the fullest. all because she ran into a new paradigm priest, someone who knew how to work with that light. Now, 
there's an epilogue to this particular story. <laughs> a week and a half later, she gets on the commuter train to go on to work. And who gets on across from her but the guy in the navy pea coat. <laughs> he wasn't dead at all. The conductor was entirely mistaken. Interesting. So just for the fun of it, just anyone here, there were several places in this story where Marianne bought into the sickness instead of the wellness. There were several. Anybody? The, the what? The conductor was one. The birdcage. The news, right? the newspaper, even when she looked in the mirror. At each and every point in this story, Marianne bought into the sickness instead of the wellness. But interestingly enough, at each and every point where she did that, she also had the option to go, oh, <laughs> or mmm. And not buy into it all, at all, and thus not create it for herself. Because you see, we are grand creators. We are amazing creators who have abdicated our place upon the throne of our own power by buying into many of the prevailing realities. And a lot of these realities, as we, as we said, are going away now. Now, to me, there are two videos out there that are just completely cutting edge. As I go to look to buy videos in the video stores and so forth, and one is our own intenders one, On the Road with the Code. The other is Greg Braden's Science of Miracles. And for those of you who haven't seen it, I'm going to describe a scene in it for you. Because again, these are the, as good as it gets. And Braden, he took a camera crew to China where they were having fantastic results with healing people. And there was a lady laying on the table, and they had the camera crew and, and the, had a sonogram, and looking inside the lady's body, and there was a growth about the size of your fist in her body. And so there were also three guys over against the wall mumbling something in Chinese. They were wearing white coats. And you see this stuff on, on this video. And they said, so let's let, the, let's let the healing begin. And they turned down the lights, and they had a camera on the sonogram so you could see what was going on here, and they had a camera on the room, overall room, with the lady laying on the table. And the three guys over against the wall, they started uh, uh, chanting louder in Chinese. And for about the first minute, minute and a half, not much happens. But about... A minute and three quarters into it, the thing begins to quiver, the growth. And by two minutes, just another 15, 20, 30 seconds, it was half size. And by two and a half minutes, pfft, gone. Gone. And you see this. And so, as Braden's getting ready to go, and they're packing up all their stuff, he goes over and he asks the facilitator, he asks the translator, what was it those guys were saying in Chinese over there, the guys in the white coats. And what they were saying is, it's already done. It is done, it is done, it is done, it is already done, already well, already done. And I suggest to you that that is the key to manifesting anything and everything. See it as a done deal and hold the picture of it already done in your mind until it reveals itself to you right there in 3D in front of you. How to make the highest and best use of this magical light working tool that we call our imagination. And here, here's an interesting one. 60 years ago, the Rosicrucians were doing hypnotic experiments on people. And they take a quill or a stick and they tell the hypnotized person that it was a, uh, a red-hot poker 
or a branding iron. They would touch it to the person's skin, and immediately the hypnotized person would cry out in pain, and a, bl a, bl a blister, a welt, began to form. Interesting, huh? They'd done it a thousand times. Always happens if the person is hypnotized. That the body will create what the mind tells it to immediately. And believe me, that the mind knows every symptom in the PDR. <laughs> We've been taught them all. And the body will create them instantly. <laughs> so fascinating. What we are, we are grand creators. And we in the intenders, we, we refrain from the naming of sicknesses and diseases because we've realized that each and every imbalance that we have is unique unto us. That we are each unique beings. We had different genetics, different parents, different schooling, different um, um, cereal for breakfast different everything, but whatever brought us to whatever particular imbalance we're experiencing any time is unique unto us. But if we lump ourselves in with everybody else who ever had similar symptoms, we do, do ourselves a tremendous disservice because we will create it. And at the same time, we always have that option to say, oh, or mmm. We always have the option to see ourselves in our highest light, happy, healthy, whole, and humming with life. And to see everybody we work on happy and healthy and whole and humming. That is my intention for you this day that, first of all, that your business, because you begin to set a course for your day, that your business thrives, and that you have success beyond your imagination. And second of all, that each and every person, each and every person who you help and heal is filled with light and is healed and that that healing and that sharing and that giving that you give through your hands, that you share through your hands, that it comes back to you a hundredfold. It's been my great pleasure to be here with you this day. May you go forth with love and know that all is added unto you. Namaste.